We are live for the book club of March, and it ain't easy being green. Green was the color of choice that dictated this month's book club winner, book club theme. And you guys chose, you guys nominated this book. And then this book went on to the poll process and it won the poll. We are talking about the Incredible Hulk, Future Imperfect. Now, when I say Future Imperfect, you might be thinking, we're living in that right now, 2024, with all the bullshit we've got going on. But this was a future that was imperfect in the 90s. This is going as far back as 1993. 1993 is when this, well, 92 born. and 93. That's when you were born? Wow. Yeah, dude. Little oh. baby. Wow. Uh, yeah, so so Hulk Future Imperfect is two oversized issues that dropped in December of 2022, December 22nd, 1992, and January 26th, 1993, written by Peter David, who was in the middle of a 12-year-long Hulk run. We'll get into that in a little bit. With pencils and inks by the incomparable George Perez. George mm -hmm. Perez. Yes, sir. Colors by Tom Smith. Letters by Joe Rosen. Now, some of you may be listening to this without any familiarity of what Hulk Future Imperfect is. So, very briefly, it is a book that actually took place separately. These, these two issues were released separately from Peter David's Hulk series that was ongoing at the time. Um, okay. Yeah. So these were, these two issues were released separately and essentially what they depict is a dystopian future, 90 years, some 90 years after, you know, Mar current Marvel at that time that sees a, an evil version of the Hulk referred to as the maestro who runs everything. He has become the sole dictator, presumably of Earth, but we don't see, you know, we don't see everything. But uh, the the world has lost itself to nuclear war. There are no more heroes. It's just the Hulk and the survivors, and he runs the survivors. And it's his playground. And just like the Terminator, in a reverse Terminator scenario, the Hulk goes to the future to fight himself. And the unfolding story is what we're here to talk about today. Welcome to the Hulk Future Imperfect Book Club. The gang's all here. We've got Kale. What's up, Hulk dogs? <laughs> all right, you tried. Marco. Hulk a uh, blow? Tyler. I don't know what the flark you guys are talking about. Jeez. Nice. <laughs> and I'm Sean saying let's rock and roll with this. Book club. Those of you who've played oh. enough Marvel fighting games will understand right. what I was getting at. Those, yeah. Uh, welcome to the audience. Thank you guys for joining us. Thanks for hanging out. We appreciate you being here live now or in the future. This podcast is supported by you, the dear listener. Uh, we talked about how the patrons are the people who chose this. So we appreciate everybody who is a, a member of our Patreon page. Patreon.com slash the comics pals. And I have an announcement to make a little bit later as far as next month's book club and how everybody is going to get to participate in the nomination process for next month. And, but, and quickly, yeah. this was hotly contested between the four of us as well. We've been arguing about this for weeks. Oh, well, yeah, that's, that's Feels like 90 true. years. <laughs> I think you're hyping up argue a little too much. <laughs> I guess it depends on who, who the speaker is. In Kale's case, he feels it's argument. So he feels attacked. I'm sorry, Kale. The discussion is generally an argument for me. So it's <laughs> conversation. As We're gonna word. argue about the Hulk future and perfect here in just a minute. We very well may. So I said that this sto this story takes place, it's it's uh it's separate from the rest of Peter David's uh Hulk run. This issue actually takes place specifically between Hulk 416 and 417, which were drawn 
by Gary Frank. Whoa. Huh. Yeah. And they're really nice. They're really nice looking. Uh, it's a Star Jammers Hulk crossover, oh, which is kind of cool. Hepsiba. Hell yeah. Yeah. Uh, Silver Surfer's in it. It's very, very good, actually. Uh, go ahead, Tommy. So when you say takes place in between, you mean publishing line wise or storyline wise? Because this is time travel. Does he like be like, oh, if you want to read what happened to Hulk, read Future Imperfect. So, no. Um, there, from what I could ascertain, and I read both issues, there's no like, there's no like, oh, the Hulk is gone now. Here's the explanation. It's more like four seventeen reflects on Future Imperfect. So in a way, it's it, hmm. it helps a lot to have read that. Um, it, I think it it makes good use of these two issues, but. I want to talk about Peter David because I think context is king when you're reading these older comic books. For me personally, it helps so much to understand the creators and their mindset before I dig into these books and certainly before I talk about them. So Peter's run began in May of 1987. It would span 12 years and he would return to the Hulk character even beyond 99, 98 when his run ended, he would work on She-Hulk as well. So, you know, intimately familiar with the Hulk and his, you know, his uh, his characters. Peter actually got his start as a journalist. Uh, that career did not lead to much success and it didn't last long. He tried to write prose fiction that also did not go very far. Then he transitioned into sales and publishing and he eventually landed in the Marvel sales department during the early 80s. Even while working in sales, he tried to sell stories to Marvel, and every single one of them was rejected. It wasn't until Jim Owsley, who was the editor of Spider-Man at the time, got that position that Peter got his first shot. The two had worked on something before, and Jim remembered him from that. So when he got the new role, he offered him, or he bought a story, I should say, from Peter for Spectacular Spider-Man number 103 in June of 1985. Later on that year, he purchased another story from Peter, which is the iconic Death of Gene DeWolf, which ran in the main Spider-Man title. I didn't even know Peter wrote that. Um, because there was a perceived conflict of interest given David's status at the time as the direct sales manager at Marvel, Peter deliberately did not promote his own Spider-Man work which he says is the reason that work sold poorly. Ultimately, he was fired from Spectacular due to poor sales and pressure from editor-in-chief Jim Shooter. Bob Harris offered Peter David the Incredible Hulk, which, of course, was a popular character with, str with a struggling series that no one wanted to write. Peter took on the job, and the rest is history. Did he continue in the sales department while he was doing the Hulk? So actually, after a little while, his name kind of started to get hot. He, he had success with Hulk. The death of Gene DeWolf story was sort yeah. of popular and famous, of course. And so once that started to happen, he put feelers out at DC to see if they were interested in having him. And they were. So he continued to work for Marvel on the Hulk and then also work for DC. And he quit the sales department. That's Probably right. very smart. Also, yeah. yeah. So instead of Marvel hiring him full time, he had to get work at the distinguished competition to get the money that the sales department was giving him. <laughs> it's interesting. Well, his passion was to be a writer. So I think yeah. he just wanted to, you know, write as much as he could wherever he could. Yeah. And um, this is common knowledge to me, but maybe not to everyone. There was always this perception that you couldn't you couldn't cross seas. Uh, yeah. That's why C.B. Sobolski went by Akira Yoshida, actually. That's the exact reason he did it. Um, because editorial at the at that time and then sales in the past wasn't allowed to jump ship. Mm. So Two different people. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Maybe the, the race change wasn't necessary, but... Let's talk about the George Perez side of this before yeah. we get into the meat of the book. Because George Perez, even at that time, was a celebrated artist... Uh, yeah. One of the most celebrated artists in the history of comic book art, certainly. But he was not originally intended to be the artist for Future Imperfect. In fact, Marvel had two different artists that they looked at before George Perez to do this. I don't know who they were. That's that's never been specifically said. Um, and George actually approached Peter for a project. Um, it's a funny story. I thought George tells it in an interview 
that he did with uh, a website called uh, 13th Dimension. Um, and he talked about how it was because of his wife reading the Star Trek books that Peter David wrote and enjoying them so much that she told George Perez that he should try to write or to work with Peter David in comics the next time there's an available project, he decided, okay, you know what? I'll give Peter a call. And right when he gave him that call, Peter was desperate because they didn't have an artist for Future Imperfect. And if they couldn't get one, they weren't going to be able to do the series. So when George called him, he was like, wait, you want to work with me? Okay, let's do it. And they got Marvel involved. And lo and behold, we got we got the Future Imperfect story that we got. Serendipitous. Yeah, Love I would be able to have an artist kill, call me for, like that. Right, especially George Perez. Oh, hey, listen, I'd be happy with uh, <laughs> Rob <laughs> Liefeld. <laughs> that's that's a big name. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I wanted to start by saying that I I can't think of too many stories that I have read that had George Perez art, and this was visually to me was phenomenal. This was awesome. So good. The, yeah the even that like opening splash what is that like the second page maybe um is just <clears> huge <throat> or the yeah it's a two-page spread um that floored me the the amount of detail involved like how much you have to actually put into the background characters there's such care taken to the shadows of the individual tv monitors that are uh hanging on this pole the buildings in the back like this guy spent time doing his craft and you can see it oozing off the page. Um, the the uh, action sequences, super fluid. He's really good at communicating things from a panel perspective. They're simple panels, but he knows what's necessary to get you and move you along the story. One of the things that I felt was uh, it, I could probably, um, this hit me maybe about halfway through the first issue I could probably remove the bubbles and I know exactly what's going on. Yeah. And I'm sure we'll get into, you know, the, the, the writing of this, but uh, I think that alone is good talent. Had a great time with this. You gotta get you sweet summer children on uh crisis on infinite earths. I've seen it, yeah. man. Yeah. It's good you, stuff. It's just you, dense. You are in for a feast. I mean, teen Titans, some Avengers teen stuff. Titans. Yeah. yeah. His Scarlet Witch yeah. is like the one I think about when I think about like comic book Scarlet Witch. It's the hair. It's uh, there's I like I, I want to talk about George Perez hair because there's a lot of George Perez hair in this book. Yeah, um, yeah. From like the the Maestro's harem that's in this to the Maestro himself. There's that one where he gets uh, socked in the nuts, and there's that panel of him just uh, <laughs> shrieking, and his hair is just all straight lines all of a sudden. He looks like Marv yeah. in Home Alone when he gets electrocuted by the 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 washer. Um, I love George Perez hair. So that, that, that is what gets me every time in, in, in a George Perez book. While we're, while we're on the subject of George, I, I wanted to read a few of his words because uh, first of all, you know, that's the accuracy, but also he's such a, he, he loves this stuff so much and uh, I got a joy out of reading it. So he said, quote, I had a great, great time doing it because I mean, Peter was very creative. It was a lot of fun. One of the things, again, I love doing comics in my retirement. This was uh, this interview was conducted when he had retired. Um, has nothing to do with my lack of love or lack of ability. When a writer gives me something, I want to make sure I do the writer justice, that I give him more than he's expecting. Peter paid me the compliment that with all the years he worked on the Hulk, I was his favorite collaborator. And I only did two books, part one and two. But it was a lot of fun and a great challenge. And up until JLA Avengers much later, it was the longest I ever inked myself on a story. Mm. And to his dedication, he said, quote, I'm not with all that detail. I'm not very fast. In fact, I had to get those last pages done really fast or else we were going to miss deadline. Remember what I said before? This book wasn't even going to come out if they couldn't get an artist soon enough. So they were working on a bad deadline. And Perez stepped up to the plate. He said, quote, no, I got to finish it. I got to finish it to the point that I worked, I think, 72 hours without a break, without sleep. I finally got the last pages sent in 
and my wife came in and found me slumped in front of the television on the chair. She called my name. She thought I had a heart attack because I didn't wake up. I was out cold. I was okay. Damn, bro. I saw, what is he, a mangaka, man? Dying on the fucking drawing table, dude? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> wow. And and you know what? It shows. It shows in, in, in the background, man. Just like any other artist would have been like, cool, this is a, a tighter shot. Cool, this is, you know, a few people in the back. No, man, it's crowd, crowd work. Yeah. Sean, which version did you read of the book, like the collection? Uh, Just two individual issues. Okay, because I, yeah. I, I read the 2015 collected edition version. And okay. there's a foreword from Peter David, um, and he talks about the George Perez of it all and that he got the first crowd page from Perez first. Mm. Um, and Perez asked for notes. <laughs> and uh and and you know peter david's like this is perfect the only thing it's missing is waldo because it's that crowded and then perez <laughs> puts waldo on it <laughs> yeah Does someone, he really someone yeah. just said he uh in the chat oh it was Ahmed said he was in the chat uh and so i've been that's what i've been looking at if you see me looking over yeah here, it's, it's on the uh <laughs> looking for waldo the rightmost page kale like right in the background where they start losing the distinction of color He's kind of monotoned. Um, he should be right there. Interesting. Well, if you guys want to get into that, I mean, I was saying this. I found him. <laughs> Do you want to? You're going to share it with see, the. I see if I can zoom. Oh no, I wasn't gonna. Oh, okay. See if I can zoom. Just see his stripey. Oh wow! I spent time on that. Once I knew he was there no somewhere, way. I had to find him. Yeah. Wow. That's so wow. cool, man. That's very cool. But but to that, you know, I was going to save this for a little bit later, but the 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 throw uh, the the collection room scene. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I got to that page and I was blown away. I was absolutely floored by how much detail was in it. So essentially, the maestro has a room not dissimilar from the idea of the collector where the collector collects all these you know trophies and items. From across the multiverse, the maestro has them from the various heroes and characters that he's encountered over the years. Because in this world, they're all dead. They died to nuclear explosion, right? Nuclear missile attacks. And also the maestro. Um, <laughs> so in the maestro's throne room is all these different objects and items. And George Perez talked about what it was like to draw that page and sort of where he was coming from with that. And I thought that that was also um, a very neat anecdote. He said, uh, and, and, and you guys are immediately going to want to look for these things. He said, uh, okay. So he said, quote, I was only doing a single character, but then he wrote the museum scene and he described a few things that were going to be in the museum that were plot specific, but uh, that they were going to be used in the course of the story, so it had to be there. That's, of course, the things like Captain America's shield and Wolverine's claws, which we saw factor in. Then he goes on to say, and then I was on my own. So not only did I keep adding more and more items in there, but I went cross company where I would put like Archie's Riverdale sweater. I would put the bottle city of Candor and more and more. And I was just having a lot of fun. Yeah, and, and they are there. In, and even in the file, like the subsequent page, they make a, a reference of it's just missing a penny. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So good. Yep. I was Wait, wondering if that was the the Green Lantern uh, thing on the top on the, on the left, kind of where they walk in through. But it almost looks like the Green Lantern. Uh, the, lantern. Battery. Oh, yeah, the, the battery. battery. Yeah. 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 Well, inside. So the so there's some fun there's some fun bits in here. So if you look inside the Sentinel helmet, the bricks. That's most likely the thing thing Whoa. Yeah, and all, chains, all yeah. the way in the back there's a blue <laughs> pelt hung up that's beast yes. Dude, yeah, you, yeah, you yeah, and i yeah, look yeah. Uh, have the Clark two favorite down. ones because those are the two that really jumped out to me they're the most gruesome insane yeah. insane very i cool. see candor yeah 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 so that's just the level of detail and passion that george perez put in here he wasn't asked to do those things that's not what was in peter david's notes or description he went above and beyond to do this. And uh, as a reader, you appreciate it. You know, if you just blow past this this page, it's like, okay, whatever. 
But if you look and you pay attention and you appreciate the art, there's so much there for you to get out of it. So mm. I just wanted to highlight that because I think that's really cool. My favorite on the uh, the right hand side, you can see like Absorbing Man's, you know, Ball and Chain, uh, yep. Doc Ox uh, tentacles, and also Stilt Man stilts, and that's my favorite. Knew, yeah, part. knew you were gonna call those out. Love Stilt Man. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of great stuff in there. It's a really cool moment. Uh, but let's let's talk about let's talk about the story a little bit. So, again, it's very it's very Terminator esque. You almost don't know immediately why the Hulk is even there. I know that for me, I was like, "What the hell is happening?" Mm -hmm. I didn't immediately understand why this was happening. I figured, okay, the the issue prior probably explains what's going on here, but it doesn't. And you kind of just have to be along for the ride as Peter David un unfolds and unveils uh, the hows and whys of this. But the book quickly gets into the action. And it's just the Hulk beating ass. You know, there's a mech dog. There's, you know, these techno technologically advanced, you know, dudes that he's got to beat down. There's all kinds of stuff. What's with the Hulk and having to fight types of dogs all the time? <laughs> dogs are strong, man. It, it, right. Mutant dog, radioactive dog, cyborg dog. Is he a cat guy? I don't understand. <laughs> but we get our first glimpse of the maestro who, you know, this is his first appearance. This is, I saw someone describe it as Peter David Stanos. I think it was actually George Perez who described him that way mm. as Peter David Stanos. And this is his first introduction. I as a reader did not know that at all. I did not know that this is where the maestro came from because I thought that the maestro was a new character whenever it was the first time that I had seen him. Um, what would that have been like uh, secret wars? Maybe. Pro uh, I mean, possibly there was the future imperfect section of that yeah. world. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, yeah. I thought that that was just where the character came from. I didn't know that he had all this, you know, this history. Um, and so the maestro is just another version of the Hulk who in this world figured out, hey, man, there's all these nukes going off. That's not a threat to me. This makes me stronger. Mm. Now I'm even more powerful. And he takes matters into his own hands and eliminates those who are still left who can challenge him and becomes the ruler of all of this. Peter David actually expands on all of that a lot over the years. Um, there are subsequent stories that go into the maestro's past. But as far as this story is concerned, what I just told you is pretty much as vague as it is. That That is the answer. Uh, but it gets more specific down the road. I uh, mean... Go ahead. Go, go. Uh, I, I think it's a, it's a simplistic enough spot. And I think because of that, it, it doesn't feel like I need to know so much for the Hulk. So I, I don't have a history with this character. So I feel like I can pick this up. I'm like, okay, I know what I'm getting. I know I know what I need to, uh, whatever knowledge I need is being told to me because it's a you know it's its own self-contained story. So um, one of the worries going back into these kinds of series and especially like this kind of era, 80s, 90s, um, I always feel like there's a lot of homework I should be doing, but I didn't have that here. And I appreciated it. And that made, you know, it, it, it's a little, um, it's thin, um, but I don't think that that makes it bad. And for what I needed to know, um, it makes it an enjoyable read. And realistically, it makes it a breeze to get through. Like I got through this maybe in less than an hour. Um, and a large part of that is the combination of Perez's art just pushing me through to the next panel. And David can get a little, you know, um, he, he puts in a lot of puns, which maybe get a bit tedious, but outside of that, I think it carries you along. I, I think in terms of like homework you need for it, all you need to know is who the, who the Hulk is. And, and I think knowing that this is Dr. Banner at the time, where it was essentially uh, Smart Hulk, because um, the iterations of the Hulk have changed throughout history. Um, at the time, this was a Hulk that was, uh, 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 he can talk, essentially. He had and, Banner's and, thoughts and the Hulk body at once. 
So, oh, like, I can't wait to talk about that. Continue. Yeah, because oh, I know I, so that, that's that some people don't like that Hulk. You know, some people like the dichotomy, dichotomy between the two, and I'm, I'm one of them. But I think once you recognize, all right, this is the era and this is the type of Hulk we're dealing with, Maestro is a perfectly reasonable extrapolation of that. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So Marco mentioned that this is a simple, sim- kind of like simple premise and everything. Totally. To me, the context of everything that I know makes this so much deeper than it is on the surface. Especially when you talk about the personalities of the Hulk and why the maestro exists. Oh my goodness. There's so much good shit here. Okay. Hulk truth are coming up. Well, you know what? You know what? I have never really cared that much about them. Like, he's yeah. not my favorite character. And I never fully got why he was popular. Like, okay, yeah, he's, you know, he's really angry, and a lot of people resonate with that. I totally get that. But what else? And reading this story and then doing all the research and reading other things, getting inspired to read other things, taught me a lot about this character that made me fall in love with the Hulk. Like, I absolutely adore the Hulk now. Hmm. Interesting. Because uh, this version of the Hulk is not one that I'm very familiar with or, or that I really care much for. Like, this version era of the Hulk, it's like, oh, cool. I liked him in Marvel vs. Capcom. Great. Um, Hell yeah. That's about it. My my preference for the Hulk is like a, 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 a I guess, uh, an act of God, you know, just like a hurricane with, with barely any real, you know, like a World War Hulk or a, a Mortal Hulk. That's the kind of Hulk that I glom onto. Um, so this was honestly kind of refreshing to read this one because it's not something I've read often. I almost instinctively avoid it. So, Well, let's talk about Peter David's interpretation of the Hulk. I think it's important to understand where Peter David is coming from when he writes this character. So Peter David has talked a little bit about, obviously, this incredible run over the years. And this is a, a, a quote that I thought was just in cri- just critical to understanding this. So he said, quote, It all stemmed from a story Bill Mantlow wrote. It depicted Bruce's youth and how incredibly abused he was by his father. I read that, and I'd been reading a lot of psychological texts at the time, and I thought this is textbook multiple personality disorder. When someone suffers abuse as a child, their personality splits. It's a survival mechanism. They develop alternative personalities. It occurred to me that was the Hulk's problem. The gamma radiation did not create the Hulk's personality. Bruce Banner did that. The Hulk was always a part of Bruce, even when he was a kid. All the gamma did was give form to an existing personality, which is why all of Bruce's attempts to cure himself of the Hulk have never worked. So to Peter David, the Hulk is not something that it's not a tragedy that happened to Bruce as a, as a response to him being in nuclear fallout, him being in the middle of a nuclear bomb. He's saying that the nuclear bomb caused the Hulk to manifest. That's what he's saying. It's a chain reaction that occurred that creates this monster. And that the Hulk personality is a product of Bruce's rage. That explains why she Hulk does not have the same problem with rage that Bruce does. When when she manifests her Hulk, it's not the same. Just like it's not the same for Amadeus Cho. They don't have the same anger that Bruce does. They're not driven by rage. So at this time, this Hulk, uh, Tyler, Tyler said uh, Smart Hulk, and that's actually a retcon. So Professor Hulk is the appropriate title for this version of the Hulk in terms of the retcon, that was a retcon that was done by Paul Jenkins at a later time. This Hulk is actually uh, originally referred to as Merged Hulk. It's a synthesis between the Grey Hulk, the Savage Hulk, and Joe Fixit, while also retaining Bruce's intelligence. So Joe Mm. Fixit is cunning and savvy, right? The mobster one, right? Yeah, the mobster Hulk, exactly. Uh, Savage Hulk is the pure rage. Gray Hulk is the original Hulk that was gray, that was 
sort of primordial Hulk. That's going back, you know, all the way. This merged Hulk is all of those put together, but it also has Bruce's intelligence. This is also a Bruce slash Hulk that is in therapy. Doc Sampson has the Hulk in therapy, helping him deal with his multiple personalities. So that's why this Hulk, this version of the Hulk exists. And the maestro is all of that, yes, but he's also something else that I think most readers probably haven't considered. The maestro represents the Hulk's father, Bruce Banner's father. Hmm. So Bruce Banner's biggest enemy, the Hulk, is the Hulk, right? The Hulk's Bruce biggest enemy is Bruce Banner. Sure. Um, that's clear. And anyone who hasn't read, anyone who's not convinced of that needs to read Hulk the End. That is probably the best singular issue of a Hulk comic that I've ever read. It's amazing. Also by Peter David. Um, but it further establishes that they're, they're each other's worst enemies. They're the only two living beings left on Earth in that book. And they are each other's antagonists. And they hate each other. In Future Imperfect, the only thing that can beat the maestro is the Hulk. But they're the same person. They are mm. the exact same person. And in issue 417 of the Hulk, Bruce, well, Hulk, not even Bruce, says this to Doc Samson. He says this incredible quote. The reason I always bottled up my anger and rage was because I saw what my father was like when he was angry. I didn't want to be like that. That's part of what caused my personality to fragment. Now, I, now I'm whole for the first time in decades. But when I looked in the maestro's face, I saw my father's looking back. Anyone who has issues with their father probably has had a moment in which they worried about becoming their father and thought about the fact that they're their father's son. The maestro is an old version of the Hulk. He is his father's son made physically manifest. Bruce hates his father. That's why the Hulk exists. The Hulk hates Bruce because Bruce is his father. It's this incestuous triangle of hatred that exists between them. Hopefully that made sense. Yeah. And and I mean, even, even like we're moving the metaphor, right? Like you hate to see yourself become that. And in this, that's what, that's what happens, right? Like the, the future trajectory is him becoming that. And he has that manifest there. And the answer is apparently punch him in the face. I exactly. also like how, according to the way you described it, Sean, that thematically this ties in with Peter David's Hulk run without it being a necessity. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's cool. Extrapolate the themes. You don't necessarily have to tie in the story, though. So, and yeah. that's what the story is. It's extrapolation to an extreme, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. It's also worth considering the fact that what, and this is, this is I guess, a, a theme of a different type, but... Uh, what kills humanity in this story is the same thing that makes the Hulk unkillable. It's, it's the nuclear, the nuclear attacks, the nuclear bombs. Uh, they create the Hulk, right? The physical manifestation of the Hulk whenever that happens. But then here it ends up killing everybody and making the Hulk even stronger. So the Hulk is like, Oh, he's like almost literally a cautionary tale as a character and in this story specifically. It also he's... makes him inhuman. You know, not, sorry, it's Marvel. I can't say that. Um, <laughs> it, it, in human. Yeah, it, it, it showcases the inhumanity within him. There we go. Uh, yeah. Interesting. I, I In that context, I read that part as well similar to the trajectory of the Hulk, he just outlasted because he has the gamma radiation, but ultimately humanity ends itself. And like that similarly follows that theme, right? Like you become your own worst enemy. And their mm -hmm. final subjugator is the Hulk. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
which so yeah, go ahead, Tyler. Which is almost an inverse of how he, the Hulk was originally treated. He was an outcast. He was treated as a monster. So he was the one that humanity shunned, and now the end game of that is the opposite. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So there's just for me, there's just so much playing under the hood of this story, and obviously I'm pulling from a lot of different things as well. But um, if you were connected to Peter David's Hulk run at the time, that there was probably a lot more. Uh, here for you than just what's on the f- the surface of this story if you were paying attention um i also wanted to talk a little bit about rick jones who is a character that i actually don't like very much um, no you i prefer rick james. these types of characters yeah yeah i don't i don't like rick jones types um snapper and, car yeah sorry snapper car yeah, I don't even like Jimmy Olsen, actually. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised by that at all. Yeah, just those sidekick characters that end up getting their own adventures and become like really popular. Like Rick Jones at some point has a, a Hulk transformation. I forget which one he has. Oh, He's done it all. Yeah, he, be- right, he becomes right. Hulk, but he also becomes a bomb. Yeah. Right. Um, so yeah, I just never cared for him. But in this story, he is kept alive. By the Hulk, but I should say by the Maestro, um, and he's the person that essentially manages the, you know, the trophy room, um, and he sits in Professor X's chair, which I thought yeah. was kind of funny, um, and it's Rick Jones that 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 calls for the Hulk to bring him here, to this time to defeat the Maestro. Did you guys know? For, first of all, do you know? Why the Hulk, why Bruce ran out into the the nuclear field in the first place, the testing ground? To save someone, right? Yeah. Do you know save who it was? Jones. It was Rick Jones. It was yeah. Rick Jones. Yeah. Yeah. I never Damn. knew that. I yeah. never knew it was Rick Jones. So the fact that he's still being kept alive, even here by the maestro, to me was, was, pretty, uh, was pretty interesting and apropos. But... Uh, yeah, so Rick Jones is the Hulk's best friend, and he calls for the Hulk to come here, and it's the maestro saving Rick Jones in one sense, but it's also the Hulk coming here to save Rick Jones ultimately in a in another sense. So he's the centerpiece character of this whole thing as it relates to uh, uh, both versions of the Hulk, which I thought was pretty interesting. So he's a total mooch is what you're saying, and that's why I don't like Rick Jones. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, essentially. I agree with that. Um, we get a really kick-ass action sequence between the Maestro and Hulk, which I loved. George Pretty Perez, much. whole issue basically, kick, yeah. kick ass and punch dick uh, action sequence. <laughs> they all out of dick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. the The first issue really establishes uh, everything that we've kind of set up until this point, and it all builds to this meeting of the minds, if you will. Uh, between the maestro and Hulk on a great um, single page spread that says that it has both the maestro and Hulk meeting face to face and they both say Dr. Banner, I presume, mm. which I loved. Just that was cheeky. Yeah. Well, it's like a face off movie poster. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a movie I prefer not to think about. Um, but then, yeah, the second issue is just. Uh well largely it's it's them kicking each other's asses. And the maestro comes out on top. The maestro comes out on top. More ways than one. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> There's that yeah, one he, go ahead. I think it's the first face off. It's it's like in the streets, right? Um where Maestro uses the uh uses a woman as like an improvised weapon. Yeah to threaten the Hulk. And, like, he doesn't kill the woman, but the amount of ragdolling he does to that poor woman... Yes. I was like, she's not okay. <laughs> I had that same thought. I'm like, he had to pause. Surely she, she's jelly now. Like, oh, there's yeah. no way Bones she survived that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's so yeah. funny. But, like, I... that's funny, but also, I guess, one of the, the themes in this that... Maybe we'll get to it, Sean, but uh, is the theme of... Uh, Women are not really characters in this, outside of the the uh, uh, what's her name, the the rebel leader, Rick's daughter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
They're objectified, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Which, it's supposed to be a dystopia, so, sure. Yeah, I mean, to me, um, there are things being said there. I think that on the part of the maestro, you know, he has, like, essentially a harem. He has access to all women that he wants. He is a conqueror. He is the final conqueror of Earth, theoretically. And he's also... A, a part of him is the savage Hulk, you know, that lays claim to whatever he wants, which includes women. Um, he has everything. He can do anything. So I just think that makes sense with that kind of thing. You know, mm. Jabba had Leia, you know, like that's just normal. Um, one thing, though, you mentioned women in this story. And one thing that really sticks out to me that I wanted to talk about is after the maestro defeats the Hulk and he can't move, he's he, he's like his neck was broken or whatever, and he keeps him, um, you know, in his chair or whatever, he brings in a slave to mm -hmm. perform sex acts on the Hulk. But the Hulk does not want that. And so he is sexually assaulted. I was going to bring this up too. Yeah. 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 And I'm sure, well, I shouldn't say I'm sure. I would imagine that people who read this at the time probably didn't think that much about it. But when I read it now, I was like, whoa, this is, this is fucked up. And, and it's multiple times. Uh, there's a, th there's other people that, you know, he's just getting fed while this woman is just fully naked on him. Um, so, uh, it's yeah it, it it's a way of punishment via maestro yeah it's also yeah it's also that thing of like um you know we were talking about how the maestro is bruce's father it also gave me that vibe of well father knows best this will mm. turn him you yeah. know yeah mm. yeah i i definitely hear that and also, it's a it's a way of emasculating the Hulk too, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. uh, which I think adds to because a lot of the book prior to this is that you know Hulk and Maestro aren't too different. You know, they keep seeing each other's moves. Maestro kind of uh, uh, catches him at every every step the Hulk makes because they are the same person. The Maestro knows what he's going to do, and I think in that moment that really sets them apart as two characters. Um, because it's something that is just not built into our Hulk to even do, you know. I've never, ever, ever felt like the Hulk was a victim or, or helpless in any situation that I've ever seen. This was the only time I've ever felt that way. And it was, it was weird. It, it really, like, surprised me to have a new feeling about this character. In that way, to see him depicted in a way I've literally just never experienced before, it, it, it caught me. And it's a very postmodern superhero type depiction, something that I did not expect to read in a Hulk comic book from the 90s. Like, sure, Alan Moore would do something like this. A Vertigo book might tackle something like this. Um, when I read it, I was like, oh, damn, there's a lot of this in, in a Hulk book? This is uh, not expected for me at all. And that was something that I was going to bring up of just like there's a lot of in terms of um, uh, violence and uh, the the assault pieces. I think the violence, you know, it, with regards to, you know, throwing punches for sure. But to some degree, I almost expect Marvel to be a bit more sanitized as a, compared to um, a DC or even a Vertigo at this time. Because I felt that as well. I'm like, oh, what, what's going on here is relatively more mature than what is my expectation. I wonder if that is something that is of the character Hulk, because I'm thinking of Immortal Hulk and even the current Hulk run, right? There is level of gore and there is level of violence there, but um, is this something that is emblematic or common for the character? And if not, then may it, it's interesting that that's happening here and for a Marvel comic. Um, I'm not, certainly not a Hulk expert, but what I have learned or what I think I've learned is that that is not, that is not traditional of the Hulk. Uh, exploring themes that deeply um, 
Peter David essentially built his Hulk run out of not that much of what Bill Mantlo was doing, where he established Bruce as having been abused by his father and all those different things. Um, it's also worth pointing out that Bruce's father killed Bruce's mother, as written by Bill Mantlo. Um, but, you know, what Tyler was saying about wanting, like, like more of a clear distinction between uh Hulk and Bruce. I think that's that's what readers sort of feel. And Marvel wanted to get away from this. Uh they wanted to move away from the smart Hulk type thing altogether and have go back to the Savage Hulk because they felt like, you know, this had run its course. So which they did. <laughs> Yeah, they they actually did immediately because Peter left the title. He said, I, "If you that's what you want me to do, I'm not doing it." So he dipped. Mm, all right, nice. Yeah. Uh, real quick, thank you to everybody that is hanging out with us live. Make sure you hit that like button. Every single one of those helps us out a lot. Super chats are open if you're enjoying the conversation. Of course, you can also click the join button to become a channel member. Uh, I also want to say that we have an announcement about the next book club uh, the next month uh, that we're going to be doing. So don't go anywhere. You're going to want to make sure you hear the end of this uh, conversation. And on top of that, we are going to read your comments. After we get through our presentation, we want to hear from you all. We're going to read your comments. So make sure you leave your comments and thoughts about what we're discussing here, this incredible story. Uh, whatever your thoughts might be, just drop them and we'll get to them a little bit later on. So we were discussing the sexual assault aspect, right, of the scene with the Hulk and the slave girl. And if it wasn't clear enough to you what Peter David was trying to get across with that, here is a bit from issue 417 of, of The Incredible Hulk, which takes place right after this. So during a conversation that Hulk is having with Samson where he talks about his experiences in Future Imperfect, the same one I referenced earlier where he talks about his father, uh, he said that the, the slave girl made him feel, quote, more helpless than he already did sitting in that chair, unable to move, unable to do anything. And the mm -hmm. look on his face and the what Gary Frank was able to get across emotionally, visually with the Hulk in that scene George sells Price. it all. Uh, well, I'm sorry. I'm referencing issue 417. So that's... Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um. So yeah, just to hammer home that that's what Peter David was trying to say with that scene. Um, and that the impact of that is, is it cascades throughout the Hulk in the future, in future issues. Uh, so yeah, then we we continue forward, and the Hulk is uh, able to get out of this this mess that he's in, uh, sort of by trying to convince the Maestro that he's gonna join his side. The Maestro is trying to bring the Hulk around to seeing his way of things. He did that, you know, by having the slave girls involved. He did that by showing him you know, how he rules and how there's an aspect of him that is actually a benevolent ruler. He gives crops to the family uh, that he deals with, the, 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 that group After of people. he steals their daughters, but yeah. Right, which yeah. is an awful thing. Um, <laughs> quid pro quo, as they say. Um, but yeah, the Hulk gets free, and it's a, it's a battle between the maestro and the Hulk in this throne room. Um, Rick Jones bites it, a Wolverine claw impales him, which was crazy. Yeah. Um, it's an awesome fight. My favorite piece from that fight, I want to hear what you all enjoyed about that that uh conflict. I really, really, really like how the maestro tries to lift Thor's hammer and can't. Mm. Because the maestro is the strongest one there is, bar none. To a reader of comics at this time. This is the strongest version of the Hulk they've seen, as far as I know. And he still can't lift Thor's hammer. Because it's not about that. Mm -hmm. 
I thought it was so interesting that he took that time. Whereas I felt like our Hulk would would have been at least this is what I you know what I was picturing was you know in the moments of that fight, our Hulk would have been like, oh, there's no freaking way. Yeah. Whereas the maestro would have the ego to be like, I've got this. And also needing to prove it to himself. Yeah. And the Hulk. Right. Exactly. And he just cannot do that. And I, I really, really love that. Um, my, Go ahead. My favorite bit in that is when uh, – so Hulk throws a shield and he's like, well, Cap never threw the shield hard enough to actually penetrate anyone. Um, so that's why he does damage to Maestro. But then Maestro throws the shield back and Hulk deflects it with the Silver Surfer's board. I was like, hell yeah. That's, that was cool. That's good Marvel right there. Just a cool ass fight, dude. They're fighting essentially on the on the rubble of the entire superhero community. Everything that was that mattered to the Hulk and existed at that time is all there. And it's just, this, yeah, this being a, like all relics, right? Like they're destroying it again. So it's already been destroyed and they're destroying the memory of it now. Yeah, there's a big focus on when uh, the maestro gets smashed into the uh, the shelf of ashes and Betty is, uh, yep. uh, hers is broken open and it says Betty Banner, not Betty Ross. Right. And, and there's a zoom in too, like yeah, yeah, to a special focus on that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice going, Betty. I think my favorite page in the whole two issues is at the end of the fight, when when Hulk uses the uh, the time uh, platform, <laughs> Doctor Doom, yeah. so, and the way the page is laid out, it, it's laid out into like three vertical panels, but you follow the action with the movement of how the time platform works. Yeah. Um, and then it's it the way that, that Perez kind of cuts the the panels in half that way too between Maestro and and Hulk, and then like in the background there's just the the the, the, the castle looming over everything. Uh, it's just that's a amazing page there. As an echo to the beginning too. Yeah, yeah, and, you know, and right, that's also the very first page. Yeah. And right before so that much. is when Maestro says, "I am the future," and the Hulk sends him to the past instead. So there's. Good play there. And and talking about him getting sent to the past, that's my favorite page, I think, of this whole thing. Yeah. Is when the maestro ends up at that very moment, the moment of the, the creation of the physical form of the Hulk. Uh, he says, it doesn't matter where he sent me. If it's in the past, I'll live to face him again. If it's in the future, I'll conquer just as I... What's that? Miles off in the distance. A man in a coat and some sort of looks like a jeep running towards a teenager yeah yeah come on you fool we have to reach the protective trench before the bomb goes off and that's bruce speaking with rick jones mm -hmm. and the maestro realizes where he is and it's too late and he just gets obliterated by this explosion and and they they see it in the beginning too it's like oh nothing can really kill the maestro unless it's a gamma bomb you know um which i have an issue with like how wouldn't that make him stronger? But that's I I put it away quickly. That that was my issue with it was just like he's also a survivor of an atomic, like a, of a, a atomic several you know, atomic right explosions. And and now point. you just kind of put him a little closer to one. You know it, it doesn't result in him growing more like more strong. A gamma bomb is different than an atomic bomb though. Bruh. <sighs> Marvel makes you makes like beats you over the head with like gamma radiation is different. <laughs> That's some different it, shit. It bro. ignores all actual scientific rules, even though gamma radiation is a thing. Right there. And he so th for this story, for this two issue story and the subsequent issues across Peter David's 12 year run, that is the close of the maestro. But he is brought back. Like there's a, I forget which story it is, but there's a story that shows that he didn't die from this. Um, mm -hmm. But of course, that's many, many years later. If we're just talking about this story, it's a, it's closed. He's he's done. There's that one panel that feels like uh, Doctor Manhattan in Watchmen. Um, yeah, where he gets zapped by the bomb. And yeah, like, yeah. Well, yeah, and the yeah, way yeah. the way those two panels, yep, kind of work backwards. You know. From each other. Yep. Just incredible work. Yeah. 
Yeah, brilliant, brilliant stuff. I really, really love this comic. It was so fucking good. You know what my favorite part Stop. is? Two issues. Yeah, yeah. Like, I don't know the last time I read a two-issue, like a modern two-issue story that can cram this much. I mean, granted, they were oversized. But still, this is a lot to cram in for two issues. The amount of world building oh. that had to be done. <laughs> do you think this? Do you think this could be compared to the Dark Knight Returns? I and... think I think it can be in the sense that it's the the, the postmodern take on a well known superhero. Yeah, and I think it has a lot of that, you know, purposely or subconsciously in its DNA. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit of a reflection on the character, but you're moving forward in time. Um, mm. I guess, yeah. Um, it's something about it feels different, and I think it's because it's just the the two issues, oversized or not. Because Dark Knight was some of those issues were you know oversized as well. Um, I don't know where it nets out in totality, but I felt like. Um, this, that has like arcs within its own story where this is kind of one continuous. Yeah. You know? I think for me, the biggest differentiator is that while this isn't, this isn't necessarily tonally consistent with Peter David's run because Peter David's run is sort of fun. It has like Rick Jones and like, I just, I just told you guys that the, the, the the previous arc and the arc this takes place in between features you know the star jammers and silver surfer and all this wild stuff and so so it's not it's not tonally similar but it's the same person it's the same it's peter david's vision of the hulk and i think that to understand this fully you kind of do need to know where peter david is coming from um and you won't know that necessarily if you haven't read some of the some of the other work or know some of the the back information. I think the Dark Knight uh, requires very little of you as far as grasping the relevance and you know what makes it so special. Yeah, I also think Dark Knight does so much more to establish. Gotham as a completely different place than what you already know. And he really chews on it, really makes, you know, right. a meal out of it. You know, like Marco was saying, there are arcs within itself with even just Gotham. Um, whereas it really feel, feels like, you know, while this is a character piece on the Hulk and the Maestro, uh, George Perez really immediately establishes how different the world is out the gate so you don't necessarily need all that world building in the same way that the dark the dark knight returns uses it well that was also uh like a pretty different batman than people were familiar with seeing so For I sure. think there was a lot of work ne necessary on that end as well to establish this character even being that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this is a fish out of... This is literally still the same Hulk. You know, yeah. like, it's not a different Hulk. So, um, I but I definitely, I definitely see the... I definitely see the comparison. Um, I also think that Peter David is not that concerned with the world around them. No. Um, I think, like Kale said, George Perez handles all that. And characters outside of maestro and hulk and rick jones and his daughter i guess to a lesser extent don't really even matter because mm. it's another timeline that they're going to shut down when this is finished so yeah, yeah exactly yeah um i i i wanted to i wanted to talk just a little bit about and and it's it's a recommendation too about hulk the end by Peter David and Dale Keown, who was a collaborator with Peter throughout the Incredible Hulk run as well. 
And it is a story that is it's in league with all the other Marvel the End stories that they've done. This is an incredible comic book. It is a singular issue, and it is absolutely a coda to me on what we just read. Um, two thousand two, maybe. That sounds that sounds like it could be that. Yeah, I'm not sure on the exact uh, date. Um. I think it's it's like required reading if you care about the Hulk. It, it, it truly, truly is. I said it earlier. It's it's it, again the Hulk and Bruce only two living entities left on Earth. During the day, Bruce walks around as a very very old man. I think they say he's been alive for like two hundred years, but he's kept alive by the Hulk. The Hulk will not let him die. At night, the Hulk hmm. takes over the body and runs around and fights bugs and does, you know, things of that nature. And when either one of them is in control of the body, they reflect upon how much they hate the other. And it is so unbelievably striking to me that they are talking so much about hating the other. They're the same person. Mm. That's actually collected in with the 2015 version. Uh, the yeah, end no. is the third yeah. issue. The, the Marvel Unlimited version uh, is the 2020 version. So it's the two, it's just the two separate issues that are, I guess, recollected on Marvel Unlimited. Mm -hmm. But the end is on there. And I did look it up. It is 2002. So that literally in our timeline is 10 years after Future Imperfect. Right. right. Yeah. Right. It, it, the so maestro, that, sorry, Tyler. Th that was actually so. the 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 end was a series of end one shots for the characters, and that was a re, uh, like a retooling of a prose story that Peter David had written uh, for mm -hmm. Marvel right, at the time. Um, I guess a couple of Marvel writers wrote prose for it, so he had to like retool it to make it more visual for Dale Keown, who Keown is like one of those. Hulk artist, like when he when you think of the Hulk, you probably visualize something that Dale drew. Hmm. Yeah, the art, his art is stellar, stellar. Yeah. Um, so you read it then, Tyler? I I skimmed. Or... I had I had read it years ago, and I skimmed through it for here. Um, okay, because you know work kind of blew up today, but. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, no worries. Uh, I didn't anticipate reading it myself. I just became personally fascinated in all this, so I decided to take a look. Um, the Hulk says these words that I thought were interesting. He says, Hulk had last laugh, and Hulk will keep laughing because Hulk is strongest one there is. And to me, when you take Future Imperfect and you take those couple of issues of Peter David's run and you take this Hulk the end and you put them together what you have is a very clear picture of a man in Bruce Banner who is actually a child who was beaten badly by his father that watched his mother be abused and eventually killed and that very same event created a hatred in him for not being able to stop his father uh, but also for being his father's son that leads him to jump into working with the United States government that leads him to being in there in that moment when the bomb goes off that creates the physical representation of the Hulk. The Hulk has to be the strongest one there is because that is what it takes to survive an abusive household. And he will continue to strive to be the strongest one there is so he can never be in that position again. That's what I see the Hulk as. And that's why I love this character so much now. The Hulk is literally the perfect survivor. That's what Bruce made himself to be. The irony being it leaves him out in the cold. Yep, exactly. He has absolute disdain for the parts of himself that he deems weak, that were not strong enough to fight his father back. He was a genius. His father mocked him for being smart. And all of those aspects of him are the aspects that the Hulk hates. Brilliant. Did this turn you into a Hulk yeah. fan, John? <laughs> yes, it did. It literally did. And Dude. I love when that happens here. And considering uh, you you finished up the, what is it, Immortal Hulk, PKJ's been on fire. Man, this is... 
Well, it's so stuff. much of what Sean is talking about is being reflected on in uh, yeah. PKJ's Hulk. I haven't yeah. gone all the way through Immortal. I know the beginning reflects on um, Major on uh, on on his father, but um, even even just the simple concept of uh, you know during the day Banner is running from the Hulk, and then at night the Hulk is chasing Banner. Like that's <laughs> straight from <laughs> what Sean was just talking about. <laughs> that's funny. Oh man. So final thoughts on this this Hulk story, Future Imperfect. Strong. Uh, I think it's a I think it's a strong entry. Um somebody who doesn't know Hulk that well, you can jump into this and it feels like you get what you need. A uh, coherent story, a good romp, um excellent, excellent art. And that all works together to make good comics. Um, and I think that this was good comics. Uh, I think uh, I appreciate the research you did on that, Sean, because I think it, it, it adds a lot of um, it adds a lot more meat or, you know, I thought this was a pretty straightforward story. And for what it's worth, if you come into it as that straightforward story, you're still getting something out of it because it's uh, again, it's fun. Um, <laughs> and uh I give it a solid. <laughs> a solid, solid. I'm I'm glad I finally filled this void uh, of in my my reading, you know, list. It, it's like when you think of the Hulk, it's like World War Hulk, you know, uh, Planet Hulk, Immortal, and this. And like now, I feel like I've read most of the big Hulk stories, so. Um, and I, and I liked it. I liked it. I'm a George Perez guy. So like this, that alone, take all the words out. Marco said it earlier. It, it's almost just as enjoyable of a book, which is not to say anything against Peter David because he still has to script it. Yeah, I really, I really love this. Um, I very, I very obviously didn't dive as deep as Sean did, but you know, I think the, the themes and some of the stuff, I, I I think a lot of it is on on its sleeve, you know. I think uh, I think Peter David, and it's one of the reasons I like have always liked Peter David is he really knows how to put his themes forward so that you at least have an idea of what you're reading. Um, and that that for me that goes all the way back to Young Justice, you know, when I was first getting into comic books. Um, and so this is just you know getting to see that on a more mature level through the Hulk, I think is incredible. Pun intended. It's immortal. Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I think my, my thoughts and feelings on this are probably, you know, pretty clear from how I've, how I've spoken about it. I had an absolute blast. Um, I, I deliberately read it first before I learned all of the context, because I just wanted a raw opinion about the story itself. Mm. And I enjoyed the hell out of it. Uh, normally when I go back to comics from this era, you know, especially like '90s stuff. I, I I don't often find like a lot there for me. This was a, a a big surprise, and I'm happy that people nominated this because I don't know that I would have read it otherwise ever. Yeah, it, um, it's funny you mentioned you know like not this the era of the '90s and this time period not being something you really want to have ever have the urge to delve into. But the more I've done that lately, the more I've found stuff that is just damn good. Um, like Generation X is a fantastic X-Men book. And that's Bacolo, early Bacolo on it. And it's 90s as well. Like this as well. I feel like there's a stigma to the 90s mostly because of what happened with the industry at the time. Um, and art became a little, you know, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, uh, samey. Edgy. Across, edgy yeah. and samey across the board. Uh, but like with book clubs like this, it helps bring me to things that normally I would have just been like, mm, not for me. Mm. I think I I think also too though when you put 
put this up against something like, uh, you know, Maximum Carnage. <laughs> right. Sure. <laughs> it, sure. As like, you know, a picture of the 90s. It's like, uh, well, it's the Hulk. And if that's what's going on in Spider-Man, what's going on in the Hulk, you know? Well, that that is that is one of the primary reasons why we opened up our book clubs to a nomination and letting you guys yeah. let us know what you want to hear us talk about because you know we were we're of a certain time and we you know we were going to read books that appeal to us specifically but this exchange allows us to find things that we might not have ever found before and then it allows us to talk to you guys about things that some of you might not have ever heard before. So I love it. This was a huge success as far as I'm concerned. So let's talk about what we're going to do next month. And we're going to get to your comments as well, guys. So don't go anywhere, but let's talk about what we're going to do next month because we have decided to go a little bit of a different direction. So everything is staying the same nomination process and all that. We are, we are going to do Tom King month beep, 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 beep. for April. So the way that's going to work is you are going to nominate a book by Tom King. The only book we are excluding is Strange Adventures because we've done that very recently. So you guys can check that conversation out if you want. But we did that like a year ago, so no reason to rehash it. Uh, but outside of that, everything else that Tom King has worked on is fair game. All you have to do to nominate a book is head on over to the patreon.com slash the comics pals for free. You do not have to pay a single cent. You just leave a comment in the post that's asking for noms for Tom King month, which is April, uh, and leave a comment with the Tom King book you want to hear us talk about. That's all you have to do. YouTube community, there's a under the community tab, there's a post, same thing. You leave your nominations there. We'll tabulate them all. The most nominated books will end up on the Patreon poll. The winner of that, just like Future Imperfect, will be the subject of next month's book club. It is that simple. What if we get his breakout novel up in the sky? What if we get his one short story in that uh, that uh, that that time uh, anthology book that uh, DC put out that one time? That's deep cut. Sorry. Whatever the people want. Listen, this was two issues. Yeah. I was or, like, what's going to go on with this? How are we going to pull this off? <laughs> yeah. Or if you want to join the Patreon, uh, one of us did a full review of Up uh, a Once Crowded Sky of Tom King. So it uh, might be worth adding an addendum to that. Oh, I didn't know you did oh, that, guy. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> we already got, people in the ch- already got people in the chat saying, all right. Tom King's two-year Batman run. <laughs> Nominate number one Shit. through eighty-five. And you know, I still have never finished that run. Me either, and I didn't have a desire to. Frankly, <laughs> I read it all, so I'm good. You guys can pick that if you want. I'm... <laughs> Style so serious Ooh. says, "What if it's Heroes in Crisis?" Then we'll read it. Whatever you we'll guys want. I was Honestly, with that that then might I'll be a quit discussion. The show. That might be one of those um, arguments that Cal keeps talking about. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this might be the time I put my foot down. I don't care what the listeners want. <laughs> oh, I'm not doing knees. it again. You're going to put me in crisis. It's funny. When we when we, when we we threw t- Tom King's name out there, we're like, yeah, yeah, sure. That makes sense. I don't think any of us thought about here in crisis. <laughs> not once. No, Co- forgot com- that. Blocked it out. That doesn't bother me at all. No, that does not yeah. bother me yeah. at all. If 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 Heroes in Crisis gets chosen, we'll do the same thing we did here. Provide the context, talk about the book. That's all. But you got That's vision. All. got some great art. Y'all well, gonna hear about it. <laughs> <laughs> what other options are out there? Vision. Uh, uh, um, what's the one he did on my old podcast? Uh, Omega Men. Omega, Omega Men. Omega, Omega Men. Yeah, yeah. Oh, a mean throwing out accusations. I never defended that book. I feel like that was Tyler. He probably did. He probably did. I don't remember those reviews, but he probably did. Me? Tyler yeah. definitely did. Oh, I did. Tyler, Tyler was, I did until the final Tyler. issue. And Tyler I was, like, was all in our chat. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> that wasn't even on the wait, show. Guys, was... He's cooking. He's cooking. Yeah, yeah he co- he cooked. Never mind. Um. So the other thing is that the, you can you can nominate right now, both on YouTube and on Patreon, both pages 
are up and you can nominate right now. Uh, but we're not done here. We're gonna we want to hear from you guys on the Hulk Future and Perfect. Share your thoughts with us on this on this book. Uh, I'm gonna let's read some let's read some uh, some comments if we can get to them. Um, Cliff Woodbury says, as time has gone on, they have turned Hulk from the simplest character to a very complex one. He now has a mindscape that should have been saved for the newest Hulk with mental gamma powers. Um. Yeah, and I think there was another comment from Style So Serious that said something to the yeah. Here it is. Why can't the Hulk just be a monster created by a freak accident through an act of heroism? So, to me, I just don't know if that was ever who the Hulk was. Well, I think especially after seventy years of storytelling, it's just like you know, at at a certain point, you. You know, you need deeper stories. Yeah, the, you know, the the man thing is can only get so deep because it's monster of the week, as opposed to, uh, in this case, compared to the Hulk or you know a Swamp Thing type. Like there, there's variations that get built out from the monster of the week origin. And meanwhile, Hulk currently is monster of the week, um, but <laughs> but even the, still, it's examining. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know. That, that dichotomy so i mean a character whose creation was inspired by frankenstein and you know things like that like that's gonna you're gonna have jekyll some high jekyll and hyde yeah you're gonna have some uh you're, you're, you're gonna have some deep thoughts you know creators are gonna come to these characters and 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 bring that stuff to it and i i, I don't think that the character is any worse for it but that speaks to what i was saying earlier there are a lot of people who just want savage hulk yeah, that's what they want, yeah. and that's—I mean—that's valid, I guess. Like, I—I I can't decry it. Certainly, we had a, a comment from Dan uh, on the Discord. Actually, uh, just like Man of Steel molded the modern Superman, Superman, David did the same for Hulk. He's the one who pioneered the idea that Hulk is a split personality issue, stemming from the trauma of Bruce's childhood. It also has Rick Jones's bachelor party and wedding, which are comedy gold, as in <laughs> Peter David's Hulk run, which I—I've not—I did not know what that was. So. Mm-hmm. That sounds fun. Uh, also, Dan and uh, Roboters here, when we were talking about, you know, the length of the issue and being able to tell a compact story, Roboters says back when stories could be told in one or just a few issues while still continuing forward, Dan says it would have been 12 issues minimum in a modern story. I think there's there's a, a level of decompressed storytelling nowadays that takes over. And this was done in, a, this was done really well. Uh, and I think if you take it to like nowadays, I could have seen this be an arc, maybe even, you know, two, uh, could this be even an event? You know, like I, I can see ways of thinking about how to milk this as opposed to let me tell the thing that I want to tell. I think especially in the hands of a, a less talented artist, I think mm. it would have, um, um, I, I mean, you know, editorial mandate aside or whatever it would have needed more to establish what Perez established. Sure. And, and Sh- Sean, from the research, I believe this was an editorial. Um, they came to Peter David with this saying, hey, we have this sci-fi uh, artist. It's a famous sci-fi artist is the way it's described in the, in the pre-material for the version I read. Um, do you have a pitch for it? He came up with Future Imperfect. Then the artist dropped out and they needed another artist. I'm curious to know who that original artist was because they don't yeah. name him and I can't find anything about it. Yeah, like I was saying earlier, there were there was more than one artist because that artist dropped it and then they yeah. tried reaching out to another person that also dropped it. But nowhere have I seen huh. who those people were. I wonder if it was Mobius. I think, you know, like, what? like oh. artists that can that can like start the book you know what i mean like to that's a yeah. big enough name to be like these this sci-fi artist is doing yeah. this book that'd be crazy wow i mean we don't have that I, would, I, I i searched that mobius would, yeah. hulk and i'm not seeing anything <laughs> so that would have lined up for the time uh we got chem dog who i think is a first first time chatter chem dog before um he said i've been collecting the hulk since 1989 uh their favorite wow. runs are the 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 they say they love the gray hulk era especially the todd mcfarlane stuff 
and they've gone back to issue 118 up to now. Wow. That's Nuts. crazy. I love I love that. I love that. You, I want to be you, that. I want to be that been, so bad. Ken Dog, you've been collecting the Hulk as long as I've been alive. Way to date the guy. Sheesh. I'm married. So I'm triggered. Oh my goodness. Um yeah, yeah. I, I love that. Like, the, I, like I want to go back and read Peter David's run. It's like crazy long. So I yeah. don't know if I have the commitment to read someone's 12 year run. Um, Which is something, something Dan says uh, a little bit later on. He says, if anyone decides to read David's run, it takes a little bit for him to warm up because he had to deal with the baggage from the previous run for a while first. So. You might try and find a, a good spot to settle in. The previous one run by Mantlo where uh, Rocket Raccoon gets introduced. So, is that true? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Todd McFarlane uh, is one of the many artists that uh, that Peter David collaborated with on on his run. It's an early Todd, but it's Todd. Yeah. It's good though. Those those green and purple covers, silhouette covers. Mm. That it's like those are that's classic Hulk there. Uh, Hunter Vaughn says, I just started reading Immortal Hulk. Can't wait to get the epic collection of this story. Hunter Vaughn, also the first person to put a, a, a recommendation in for the Tom King post on YouTube. Uh, starting off with uh, Mr. Miracle, which kind of what I expected. Yeah. Okay, yeah. You know what? Admission time. I have not read the final issue of that for whatever I'm, reason. I haven't read it. At all. Really? I bought it because I had just moved to Luxembourg and I was waiting it out, um, but I could never get it. So I had to wait until I, I think, came to England before I was able to get it. And that was like a year after it had already been in trade. So I and I still haven't read it. <laughs> I feel like I remember reading it, being um, floored and amazed, and then like the back end. I, I don't remember it landing for me. You know what? We got to get Tom King on here. We got to get yeah, him on here for Tom King month. <laughs> Facts, that's, bro. that's the goal. It's funny. I went. I went to go pull out my my copy of Mister Miracle that Mitch drew a little, little Mister Miracle nice. in for. Nice. Um, and then I pulled out Rorschach instead. And now I'm like, oh, Rorschach's an option too. Oh, Rorschach yeah. is a great that's option. A that I would was love a good to one. read yeah. that. Sheriff of Babylon, of course, is a phenomenal option. Mm -hmm. uh, Supergirl, Woman of Tomorrow. Yeah. Like. I expect that that will be nominated a lot. Yeah. 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 Um, there are a lot of great reason. Tom King options. He's a good writer, man. He is one of the best. I just, you know, Wonder Woman notwithstanding to me. But uh, can I do one more bit of conversation before we wrap yeah. it up, I guess? Yeah. Uh, so when we were talking about the, um, the, the maestro sending the the slave girls in to uh, assault the hulk um roboters said that i think it works in what maestro represents for the future it should be nasty and dirty since the character forms from abuse um and that goes along with the conversation we were having there um he says marvel does have a track record in terms of stories during the 80s and 90s avengers x-men all have had to deal with really problematic situations of assault. Um, I remembered there is a spy an issue of Spider Man where he uh, admits to being sexually assaulted uh, as a, a a young boy. Um, and this was from like 1984. Whoa. Um, it seems like there's some contention about whether or not that's canon because it seems like it was a like a PSA comic, you know, like an awareness comic or whatever. Was it like a hostess ad? No, no, no. It's like a, a full issue of like a you know a a a full story, like a full issue of content. Um, but it was with uh, it was in leagues with like the um you know, the Association for Childhood 
uh, something or other. Um, anyway, so just, you know, Marvel, uh, Marco mentioned that he sort of thought that Marvel would be a bit more sanitized in their storytelling. Yeah. And I don't know. I, that, that made me go, Ooh, that's very wrong. <laughs> Marco, let me tell you about a superhero called yellow jacket. <laughs> There's a there's a character in I believe it's the subsequent issue of the Hulk, but he's I he's a recurring character I believe, uh, who is gay, and there's another character who's kind of giving him the cold shoulder, his friend, because he's gay, and that's an interaction that is playing in the background of that story. So even just within the midst of this Hulk run, they're dealing with hot topic issues in society at that time. It's very Marvel, very Marvel. They they said, um, "Fuck standards and practices, fuck the comics code," and Marvel mm. dared them to enforce the code on them. Mm. There was some stuff, man. A lot of nudity in this book. <laughs> like it's never graphic, but it's as close as you, as you can get to it without it yeah. being there. Yeah, yeah. Dan saying now that that was coming up a lot in the eighties, and it was the first time it was deemed acceptable to discuss the topic, so it came up a lot. Uh, even in sitcoms. Huh. Marowak Oscuro says, what do you think about the Maestro's three miniseries from a few years back? I have to admit, I have not, I've not read them. I've not read them. Tyler, you're muted. I, I was going to say, I haven't read it because I haven't read this. So like, I never, I didn't want to go backwards. If that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, Roboter says, Sean, reach out to Sal and make Tom King happen, pals. It would be amazing to do a book club and then get him for an interview. Well, that's the idea of these months. You they know, for me, us. it's not, yeah, it's not just about doing the book club. I want to reach out to the creator. You know, we're going to have some fun things happening on the weekly show, the main show on Saturdays regarding this topic. So we're going to do some things. And uh, if we can get Tom King on here, that would be phenomenal. It helps a lot when you guys let creators know that you want us to talk to them. If you reach out to Tom King on on X or Instagram and you at us and say, hey, we want to see you talk to the Comics Pals, then maybe when we reach out, he'll be a little sweeter on it. You know what I mean? So that would be great. I hope that that happens. I also hope that you guys enjoyed this discussion. I hope you guys had a great time with us talking Hulk, Future, and Perfect. I thank you all for giving us the platform to do this and for nominating this book. Thanks to everybody that nominated it. Thanks to everybody that nominated any book. And once again, if you can hear my voice um, and it is not, and it is not uh, June, then we want you to go nominate. We want you to nominate. We want you to hit the Patreon, uh, hit the YouTube community tab and nominate books. And then if you want to be a part of the poll that drops after that, make sure you're connected to us on patreon.com slash the comics pals where you can uh, where you can vote for your favorite book that Tom King has done. So thank you guys for hanging out with us. We really appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you next month for the next